Um, hi guys, I'm Bruce. It's really good to see everybody, see some faces, get to actually talk, have a conversation, even though this is an online class. Um, today, I'm going to tell the story of how I got the summer job that I'm at right now. Um, just for some background, like I said, I go to Bio University, going to my senior year next year, and uh, my degree is applied physics, so I basically want to do engineering. Um, and to be to get an engineering job after college, you really need experience. And so since I started college, I've been really trying to get a job. And this is only my second summer, but I, the first summer, the first year of college, I applied to like 50 or 60 jobs. And I just heard nothing back. I didn't, I mean, got maybe a few no's, but mostly just nothing. Um, so I talked to my career advisor. She told me to reach out to any family or family friends I had that could help me get a job. And so turns out I have a great uncle on my dad's side who works at this really cool national lab. And I reached out to him. Uh, I talked to him. He said that he did have an internship program where he worked, but that that first summer they had already finished their recruiting and there was no spot for me. But he told me to apply this summer and um, said that he should be able to get me in and that it should be pretty solid. So this next year rolled around, kept applying November and December. I applied like 40, 50 jobs, but I made sure to call my uncle, um, turned to my application, made sure it was perfect. And I was honestly really confident that I was going to get the job. Uh, that was about January. And then the months and the weeks start going by. Uh, January is gone. February is gone. March is gone. And I am hearing nothing back. Start to get nervous. I start to get flashbacks of uh, the year before and not having a job. Um, but my only hope is that the website that I applied on said that April would be the last month that I could hear back. And my school got out the first week of May. So I said, at least I'll know before the summer actually starts whether or not I have a job. And that was until April came and then April went and I still heard nothing back. At this point, I was starting to get really nervous, uh, really panicky. I didn't know what I was going to do with the summer because this job is in Palo Alto and I live in San Diego. So I don't know where I'm going to live. I don't know where I'm going to work. Start to get really panicky. Then it's finals week. I don't really have much time. I'm tired. Uh, Monday rolls around. It's pretty good. I only have one final. I go to sleep that night. I wake up Tuesday morning check my phone, scroll up on my email 10,000 times, still nothing, take my finals, I go to sleep Tuesday night, I wake up early Wednesday morning to study, check my phone first thing in the morning, nothing, last thing before I go to bed, nothing, um, so I go to sleep Wednesday night, and by the time I wake up on Thursday, I'm exhausted, I have been sleeping like four hours because I've been studying, I am panicking, and I'm nervous, and I'm stressed about this job, I'm pretty much ready to give up. I'm pretty much resigned to not having a job this summer, to just finishing school and crying for the entirety of the summer. Um, and so I wake up at five in the morning. I have a final at seven in the morning. And by the time I'm done, it's like nine. I'm walking back to my dorm with a buddy. And at this point, I'm so upset. I'm so emotional. I'm so tired that it starts raining and I I'm this close to losing. I'm so close to losing it because I hate the rain. I hate being wet. I hate being cold. So the rain is my least favorite thing in the world. And we're walking and we're walking. I keep getting these buzzes on my phone and it's starting to bug me. It's starting to really bother me. I'm, I don't want to deal with anything. I'm just trying to talk to my friend and forget about all the pain. And so I finally reach into my pocket to grab my phone. And I don't know if it was a sleep deprivation or what, but I felt like time moved really slow as I got my phone. And, you know, my face ID unlocks the phone and I see I got a text from my uncle. So I get really excited. But before I can read it, it starts absolutely pouring, like pouring that it's harder than it has the entire year. I go to school in Orange County. It doesn't even rain that often, but it starts pouring like crazy. Heaviest rain I've seen. And I'm trying to read this text, but the raindrops keep hitting my phone and messing up my fingers. So I, I finally click the text. And I see he texted me, he said, you know, they'll get back to you tomorrow for real, but I can tell you, you got the job this summer. And at that point, I was so emotionally raw and tired that I looked at my friend, I looked up and I just screamed. I just went, ah, I just let out this big cathartic roar. And I was like, I, I am happy, but I'm just tired. I'm ready to go to bed. But yeah, that's the story of how I got my summer job. Thank you guys for listening. Bruce, first of all, I'd like to say congratulations on getting your job. That's amazing. Thank you.
And I thought you did really well. You were very engaging and you kept the attention on you and your story the whole time. Thank you. You were also giving a lot of eye contact. So that was good as well. Oh, you, you. Even though you had flashcards, you barely looked at the, at the flashcards. So that was great as well. Thank you. Yeah, I did this about like four times before the Zoom. And so I eventually just like stopped using the flashcards. Like I made them and then I was like, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I mean, you did really good about like keeping eye contact and yeah, you hardly even used your cards at all. So no, it was it was good. I was uh, engaged in the story. So thank you. How was the timing? Because when I was first testing it, it was kind of like a little bit on the longer side. So I tried to cut some stuff. I don't know if we're like timing this at all, but I did it feel kind of long or? Well, yeah, I haven't, I haven't been timing it. I mean, I don't see a timer on here, so I'm not sure how long it was, but it seemed like it was like at least four minutes or so. I mean, okay. I, yes, yeah, so I was actually going to ask if um, anyone would want to be the designated timer. Mm -hmm. And if so, um, pretty much give, we should give at least um, two signals, a one minute left mark, and then we could, um, I don't know, do another mark for 30 seconds, because we are trying to aim for um, three minutes. And of course, if it goes over three minutes, you know, it's not going to be a mm. huge penalty, but we don't want it to be like six, seven minutes. <laughs> yeah. How about we do the thumbs up when there's 30 seconds left? And oh, I yeah, that, that's perfect. So one minute and 30 seconds. Or should we just do 30 seconds? I think a minute because that way it will allow the person to kind of get a sense, okay, how much time to I kind of have left. And when they get 30 seconds, like, okay, I'm almost done. You know? Perfect. I'll do that. Just give me like a hand signal or something to know that I've gone over. This for one minute and this for 30 seconds. Okay. All right. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Hello, my name is Justice, and this is my speech for my comms 103 class. I'm going to tell you about my first day of like really hard work. And to this day, it still remains like one of the most exhausting experiences I've ever had in a work day. I was 21 at the time and living in uh, North Carolina. And uh, Unfortunately for me and my girlfriend at the time, uh, the restaurant that we both worked at had shut down. And so, uh, seeing as there were bills to be paid, I had to figure out something quick to try and make some money. I got on Craigslist and after some looking, I found a posting that said, light construction work, start immediately, $12 an hour, need boots. Now, minimum wage over there was $7.25 an hour. And I had boots, so I was like, this sounds like a good deal. Like, I'm going to I'm gonna and do this. And as soon as I reached out to the guy, he uh, called me right back. He's like, okay, sure, yeah, like, show up. Show up tomorrow. You can start working. And I was like, okay, cool. So I get out there to, like, this massive ranch or manor or something. Apparently, the guy who owned it was the owner of Smithfield uh, Barbecue, which is like a KFC joint out there and they bring us up to this massive house like surrounded by these mounds of dirt and like a huge pile of rocks and uh they say all right we're gonna be moving and setting the dirt so we can lay the cobblestone to surround the house the pile of rocks apparently was cobblestone imported from ireland that cost ten thousand dollars so on top of everything we had to be careful with it as well so we get to work. I mean, at first I'm shoveling dirt and I'm like, this is not so bad. I mean, you know, this will this will be fine. But then the day starts to really heat up and the summers out there in North Carolina could be like extremely brutal. And today, that day, sorry, was one of the like hottest days. I mean, that I can remember. It ended up getting to be like 110 degrees. And, and as all this dirt is being like moved around, and we're like kicking up this huge like cloud of dirt that's just like hanging over all of us. And it's getting everywhere. It's getting in like my mouth, my eyes, everywhere. And then some of us began to move the cobblestone and these things were beyond heavy. Each one took like two of us to even move it. And then I start really sweating like that. And it didn't matter how much water I was drinking. It's like I was sweating it out just as quickly. And <laughs> In my head, I'm like, I need to get out of here. This is not 
what I thought of as light construction work, just leave, just leave. But when you're around other people and they're uh, like toughing it out, you kind of just uh, tell yourself, you can do this, you can do this, sure. And uh, I remember for lunch, I was so exhausted. Like I couldn't even really eat. Like I was like, it was, I had to force myself to eat. It was like, my appetite wasn't there. That was concerning. Cause I'm like, okay, that's never happened to me before. <laughs> Anyways, the second half of the day did not get any easier. And uh, as, it, as we got into the afternoon, this guy next to me collapses. And I'm like, okay, like, our, like, and his friends come over and take him to the shade. And they're like, oh, don't worry about it. I'm like, don't shade, like this man needs an ambulance. Like, are you serious? And they were like, no, 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 this has happened before. It's okay, he'll be all right. I'm like, okay, I'm like, and then I just, I'm taking in the scene, like, what, like, what am I doing here? This is insanity. Like, there's just, I, I, I'm gonna die out here or something. Uh, luckily I made it through the whole day. And at the end of the day, the guy in charge was like, so how was your first day? I was like, um, it was good, but I gotta be honest with you. I'm not coming back tomorrow. Like I can't do that again. And he's like, okay, that makes sense. He's like, most people just walk off or, uh, you know, don't show up the next day. Thanks for letting me know. I was like, okay. And there was some good that came of this day because beside, besides the money that is, let me tell you, the relief and utter joy that I had getting home that night and washing off and eating dinner and drinking that first beer is like indescribable. Like it was just the best feeling ever. And on top of that, anytime I have a rough day now, I'm just like, it can't be as bad as that day. That's it. Awesome. That was awesome. <laughs> I would say um, at the, the first half, you were not using a lot of gestures, but it, it was great that towards, I, I would say towards the middle, you started using a lot of gestures. So oh, sure. yeah, I, I yeah. It was good. Um, <laughs> also, I would suggest because to never say sorry whenever you're presenting, because even if you mess up, if you don't say sorry, the audience might not know that you messed up, you know what I mean? So just yeah. continue going forward. Because by saying sorry, you're allowing the audience, you're pretty much letting the audience know, oh shit, I fucked up. <laughs> no, I know. I, uh, I, as soon as I said it, I felt that too. <laughs> oh, God, I thought that you did a really good job of capturing your audience. And I felt like it was a very good story. And that is gnarly that you <laughs> experienced that. Rough. And the fact that you were caring about that person as well, you know? I, I was like the only one. It was weird. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's yeah, that's like, that, that type of field is, I know it's meant, it's like known as hard, but I love the story. Good job. <laughs> Isabella, um, Justice, were you able to see whenever she, when she put her thumbs up or? I did, but I was like too caught up and I didn't really react to it. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. I, I, I was just wondering because it. I don't I'm know if I'll be able to do it casually. What was it? I'm just going to try and do it casually so it doesn't interrupt anyone. Yeah, I don't no, know. I, I saw it though. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I just want to know because I don't know if I'll be able to see it. That's what I'm saying. Like, wait, was he able to see it or, or was I it? Could, I could see her gestures, but um, I wasn't really registering it, to be honest. <laughs> okay. By any chance, um, Isabella, since you're sitting a little bit farther, can you uh, raise your hand? That way we, we know yes. when you're doing it. Because I don't know whether, uh, I mean, I wear glasses, so. Yes. <laughs> I don't know whether I'll be able to see it or not. Sounds good. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to tell you about the story of my experience actually going through hell and back. Of course, I'm not referring to the literal hell and back. I'm actually referring to running a marathon. And for those of you that might not know, um, that's actually 26.2 miles. And man, did those miles seem forever. When I was actually 16, I was, and in high school, I was part of a running team that would actually train for the LA Marathon every year. But little did I know that even though I was a trained runner because I was in cross country and in track, my feet were not gonna like this event at all. So every year, even though we still prepared by running at least two 13.3, um, mile events and 18 miles at least twice. 
there was still a chance that, you know, even though you're trained, you could still, as they say, hit the wall at a certain point. So as the morning of May 25th, 2009 came along and I was stretching and also warming up for the event, I just kept on telling myself, you know, I got this. But man, little did I know that <laughs> it was gonna feel like hell and back. So as I started, I, I thought to myself, why am I feeling this? I don't know if it was because of course, it was my first time running the LA Marathon or because as I was running the supporters on the sidelines literally had signs that read hell and back. So as I was going through it, I continued to tell myself, no, I, I don't wanna believe them, you know? I still got this. But man, once I got to mile 22 and my legs were shaking and my legs wanted to give up, I started thinking to myself, shit, I don't got this. Um, so, but of course I still continued because I actually wanted to demonstrate to my coach and my team that, you know, that I was not a quitter. So as the time went by and I started seeing all the banners and the markers of each mile, um, I just wanted to get over with. And once I saw mile 26, I ran the fastest that, that I could. But at the same time, I wanted to cry because it didn't say finish line. And that's when it hit me. I was like, shit, I forgot about the point too. <laughs> so I just waited until the finish line, of course. And then, but once I saw the finish line banner, I sprinted the fastest I ever could. And I just felt more of a relief. And as soon as I crossed it, I told myself, finally. But even though this run, yes, it was hell and back, I still learned from it because it allowed me, um, it taught me not to give up so easily. And also till this day, I still carry that mentality. So even though it was hell and back, I will say though, that till this day, I would still rather do something else that's more difficult than run the LA Marathon and experience that hell again. Thank you. Alejandro, that's amazing. What an accomplishment. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty hard. We trained for the whole year for it. I also thought that it was really, you did a good job with all of your gestures and your mannerism. So well done. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. One thing I was going to say is it seemed like you had a really good uh, structure for yours. Like I could tell there were certain beats you were going to hit, like lines that you knew that were coming. And I thought that that like those fence posts helped like, you know, kind of carry your whole story along. So I thought that was great. And it was good that we could clearly all tell that you prepared a lot. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I mean, you could tell that there was a very like intro body conclusion type that I mean, it just it kind of like flowed better than than uh, I felt mine did anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. All right, so I guess it's me now. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Kaylee Arias. And I'm gonna tell you a story of when I was stationed in Japan. So ever, fit, ever since I was a little kid, I've always wanted to visit Japan. And high school came around and I knew I didn't wanna to go to college. So what I did was join the military. Um, at the end of boot camp, the orders I received were for Sasebo, Japan. And I didn't know whether to feel excited or scared um, either way, I had no choice. So I remember the first time I went out into town, I felt as if I was in a different world. Um, Japanese lettering everywhere you walk, everywhere you go, so quiet. Um, and that was very weird for me since I'm from New Jersey and everyone is so angry and loud. Um, I loved all the food Japan had to offer, but the ramen is what really changed my life. Uh, my friends would get annoyed with me because all I wanted to eat was ramen gyozas. Um, learning more about the Japanese culture was beautiful. Witnessing the cherry blossoms, though, in person um, was an experience I will never forget. I felt as if I was in a movie, really. 
um, soon after I visited the Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Museum and learned so much about the destruction and chaos that occurred during World War II. Um, one reason the United States decided to bomb the city was due to Japan's unwillingness to surrender unconditionally. And this bomb was actually more powerful than the one that they used for Hiroshima. Um, the landscape of Nagasaki was nestled in narrow valleys um, between mountains, which reduced the bomb's effect, limiting the destruction to 2.6 square miles. I was in awe about how a country went through so much destruction and despair, yet it has completely rebuilt itself, which shows the resilience of the culture and its people. I was very fortunate to have visited this country at such a young age, yet it changed my perspective on the people, politics, and culture. I can't wait to go back in the near future and this time make an effort to climb Mount Fuji. Unfortunately, I didn't get the chance to climb it because the engineers on my boat were too busy. There's a people saying actually that says if you didn't get to climb Mount Fuji, you're bound to go back. Um, so I can't wait to go back and visit new places that I haven't been before. Uh, the locals kind of shocked me because I was never used to that type of behavior. And Japan was a once in a lifetime opportunity and this country will definitely have a place in my heart. That's it. Thank you. Did you say they were littering? Was that? You said they were littering everywhere? No, no, not them. I think uh -huh. uh, what I when I spoke about like the comparison with, you mean like New Jersey to them or? I don't know, I, I misheard, sorry. Okay. I would say when it, well, the volume of a voice is good, but I would say when it comes to the delivery of your voice, I don't know if it's because you were just reading your flashcards. Sometimes it could be very monotone, um, but the volume, I would say the volume of it, I, I guess, was good. It, the computer was still able to pick it up, but I think it was just funny because you're just reading off the flashcards. But I would suggest, I think the only suggestion is um, like giving slightly more eye contact because yeah, you would give us eye contact, but something most of the time you were just reading off the cards. Okay, yeah, that's fair. No, I thought it was very engaging. I thought it was cool. I was into your story. I mean, um, is Nagasaki still like leveled or is it like, did they rebuild over it? I'm curious. Uh, no, they, they did rebuild some things over it because you can like go a few stairs and um, it would show you like where the like destruction was actually at, so. Crazy. I believe um, my turn. Yeah. Okay. So my story that I'm going to tell you guys is why I always trust my gut feeling. Always. Um, so pretty much on August 26th, it was a random Thursday. It was 2021. I went to work and everything was super normal. And I had just gone into work, I was working, and then suddenly my manager just starts asking me to work the next day. And I never work Fridays. I would never, ever work a Friday. And it's been like that my whole life. I used to never even go to school on Fridays. That was just always something I never did. So I said no. And then throughout the day, he would have different people, different coworkers come up and ask me, why won't you work tomorrow? And I just had this gut feeling that I shouldn't. So I kept saying no. By the end of the day, he wouldn't let me clock out unless I said yes. So I finally was like, fine, I'll come in tomorrow, but I'm going to leave at one instead of two because I don't want to be here as long. So he agreed. I wake up the next morning. Everything's normal. Everything's fine. But I couldn't shake that gut feeling 
from my chest. And I was like, okay, it's fine. I'm just going to go to work. Maybe I'm just nervous about working a Friday. So I went to work. Everything was normal. Everything was fine, but I couldn't shake this feeling. By the end of my shift, I was stalling going home for some reason. And usually I would sprint out of work, sprint to my car and get out of there as fast as possible. But that day I was stalling. And where I live, there's a lot of traffic around summertime, especially in August. So I was like, I'm going to be late to go home anyways. So I was like, that's fine. I'll just order some food. So I ordered some food and finally I'm going home. And then I get stuck in traffic and I can't shake this gut feeling. And I was like, maybe I should turn around and go to the gas station, get some gas and just chill. But I was so tired that I was like, I'm going to go home. So I was driving home and then I got to this one light where I was like, should I go straight or should I turn? And I was like, if I turn, it's way faster than if I go straight because a school is like leaving. So I was like, I'm going to turn. And immediately once I turned, I knew that was the biggest mistake. I had that gut feeling had gone away and it turned into a bad feeling. And then I heard like a crash and I assumed that was the bad thing. So I, I turned my head to look over, see what happened, see if everyone was okay. And as I was looking over, I see someone coming right at me and hits me right then and there. And that was my first ever accident. I had never been in an accident before and I lost all control of the car and I had no idea what to do. But then and there is when I realized I should always follow my gut feeling and I should always listen to any bad feeling that I have. Because every time I ignore it, something bad always, always happens. Thank you. Awesome. I love how you finished the conclusion with the same way that you've started the speech with, you should always follow, you know, yeah. your, your gut feeling. So it was pretty good. Thank and you. you. And you also gave a reason at the end as well on why. So it was a nice conclusion and also your eye contact. Thank you. Bianca, I had chills the whole entire time you were telling that story. And I just wanted to say that I wholeheartedly agree. Amen. Always follow your gut instinct because I can't tell you how many similar experiences I've had that you don't listen to your gut and something bad happens. It's an intuition we have as women, I think. Yeah, for sure. And I never listened to it before because it was always like small stuff. But that day I realized... I will always listen to my gut feeling. Okay. It's my turn. I'll just time myself. Well, I could time you. Don't worry. I got you. Are you sure? Yeah. So we agreed one minute and then... 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Just give me one second. No worries. Awesome. Can you see me? Yes. Okay, okay. awesome. First of all, I would like to say good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Isabella Baldwin, and today I will be telling you the story about the time that I broke my collarbone on Christmas Day. So it started out as any other Christmas morning. I went downstairs to open my presents with my family, and we had an amazing time. Um, every single year, my grandmother, Alma, gets us all of the grandkids matching Christmas outfits along with all of her children. So my father and all of my aunts and uncles have the same outfit on. The day keeps going and we go to my grandparents' house. At my grandparents' house, we had an amazing time just hanging out with each other and, you know, enjoying Christmas day because I love Christmas and I love my family. So as the day goes on, it's getting about evening time. It's about 4.35 PM and my grandma, Alma, asked me, if I would like to take all of the grandkids to the park. I'm the oldest grandchild of 10 grandkids. So I had nine grandkids that I was responsible for, all of my cousins and my two sisters. So the park is about a 10 minute walk away from the house. And so I was like, of course, Alma, I would love to take everyone to the park so that the adults could set up for dinner. 
get all the kids out of the house. At the park, we're having a great time just running around playing freeze tag. And then um, my little cousin, Josh, he was about eight years old at the time, he brought his football. So I, we were all in a circle, just throwing the football, so much fun, nothing crazy going on. And all of a sudden he keeps coming up to me and he's going, Isabella, go tackle Annalise. Annalise is my younger sister, by the way. He keeps coming up to me and going, Isabella, go tackle on Elise. I keep saying, Josh, no, I'm not going to do that. And the more he's persistent and antagonizing me, I finally succumb and I say, all right, Josh, I'll go tackle on Elise. So he throws the football to my sister. I run after my sister and I tackle her. However, I didn't really tackle her because I don't know what I'm doing. So as I'm falling to the floor, I crunch myself and she crunches on top of me. And that is how I broke my left clavicle. Afterwards, nobody has a phone. So I'm laying there on the ground, broken. And my sister did cross country at the time. So she sprinted back to the house. She made it there in two minutes. My father came, drove his car over. All of my cousins used the little two finger method and scooped me up because I couldn't move. They helped me to the car and we drove to the, the emergency room. Uh, keep in mind, I'm still in my matching pajamas with my two sisters and my father. So we get to the emergency room, we all walk in and the nurse says, what happened? And I, didn't have to have any surgery or anything. I just got some medicine and had a sling, but that is the story of the time that I broke my collarbone on Christmas day with my whole entire family surrounding me and I ruined Christmas dinner. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, awesome. That, I love how one, your eye contact was amazing. And the story is also, it's pretty cool because you know, it's relatable because I feel like not only was it during the holiday, but it was also relatable to everybody because I feel like everybody has kind of like a, something they do during the holidays. And it was cool that you played FOPA and still <laughs> did it, you know. Um, I also like your gestures and also the pauses that you would give sometimes to pretty much um, kind of give, for certain terms, you gave them more of a sense of meaning when you would give those pauses. So it, it was pretty great. Thank you. Yeah, I thought you did pretty well. I mean, you hit all the points. You were animated. I mean, it was uh, pretty good. Yeah. Thank you. You must have hit her pretty hard if you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, <laughs> I hit her so hard. So I, I still have like my collarbone is still like this. Oh. Um, so if you like touch it, you can feel how the bones didn't ever grow back this way. They grew back like that. So it was a full split. It, it was a long recovery. Rough. Was this when you were younger? This was 2019. Okay. Christmas 2019. So right before 2020, the year 2020. So I was 20, I was 20, 21, right around there. Oh, I thought you were a kid. No. I was the adult. Because <laughs> something similar happened to my sister when she was in elementary school, where she got like tackled and broke her collarbone. Yeah, I was the adult. Oh, like that's kind of what I picture. No, I was the adult responsible for all the grandchildren. And I got bullied by my eight year old cousin to go tackle my sister. And then I broke my collarbone. <laughs> it's like instant karma. <laughs> she was fine. And the funny thing is, she was like, 115 pounds at the time and I was like uh, like 150 pounds or something so it was like how does this dynamic work but you know it was funny all right guys we did it story time Woo! good job everyone